Well, good morning once again. Grab your Bibles and turn to what may be the easiest verse I'll ever ask you to find in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, okay? Starting a new series today, five weeks we're going to focus on in his image. What does it mean for us to be created in the image of God? Now, we're going to start with just this very basic statement that everything in the Bible builds upon. And it is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 that says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So everything else in the Bible builds on this. And if you can accept that statement as being absolutely true, then it unlocks everything else in the Bible. It answers our questions about who who I am and why I am here and what is God's plan for my life? How is life supposed to work? And if we really believe the Bible's explanation for the meaning of life and the beginning of life, then it will also help us to engage our culture today that has gone off the rails in many respects in many issues, and, uh, and we need to be able to, to answer and respond to that in a biblical way. And so we're going to spend about five weeks, hopefully, to equip you uh, to, to handle some very difficult things that you, we face in culture today. But it's so important for us to have, have the rope of our lives tethered to that anchor. Otherwise, we're going to drift into unimaginable misery. So, as we scroll down through Genesis chapter 1, we see God's creation week. And uh, day one, he created light. Day two, he created the sky. Day three, he created the, the dry land, the seas, the plants, the trees. Day four, he created the sun and the moon and the stars. Day five, he made the creatures that swim and the creatures that fly. Day six was a huge day. He created the animals that live on the dry land. And then he comes to the pinnacle, to the crowning achievement of creation when he makes the first humans. Let's read about it beginning in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So, God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So then he goes on to explain how the first humans operate in this, this world that God has placed them in. So we pick up in verse 28. So God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. So on day seven, uh, God finished his creative activity and he rested. But up to day six, the narrative flows along as God sees each day of his work and his creation, and he says, it was good, it was good, it was good. But when we come to day six, at the end of day six, it's different. Notice it says that God saw that it was very good, very good. And the reason that it was very good is because of what God is doing there. He is creating the first man and the first woman, clearly something unique out of all the other creation. And and on top of that, he creates them in his own image. And he says it's very good. 
So we're going to spend the next five weeks talking about what does it mean to be made in the image of God. For those of you uh, familiar with the phrase imago Dei, the Latin for that, uh, that, that phrase in his image, in the image of God. Now, you may not have given much thought to this, um, but I want you to understand and see over the next few weeks that this is one of the most important concepts in the Word of God. And if we don't understand this, then we're going to miss out on a lot of what our purpose and meaning in life is. So I want to show you how being made in the image of God shapes the way you see yourself and your purpose in life. And it shapes the way you see other people. And it shapes the way you are able to engage with some of the most crucial issues that are happening in our culture today. So we're going to talk about what does the Imago Dei, the image of God, have to do with gender issues? What does it have to do with the sanctity of life? What does it have to do with racial reconciliation and a number of different issues that are swirling around us literally every day in our culture? So this is all about our identity as human beings. You know, identity is a big thing today. We, we don't want anybody stealing our identity. You can't get into your phone unless you, uh, you press in the code or put your thumb on the pad or let it see your face to recognize it because identity is important. We don't want someone stealing our identity. And yet, what's happened in culture today and what has happened down through the ages in history is that our God-designed, God-given identity has been stolen. And so it's a proper understanding of what it means to be made in the image of God that restores all of that. So the most important thing about who you are, your identity, is that you are created in God's image. And to be made in his image means that God has left his imprint upon every human being. And, and, and in doing that, he has determined that he wants to show something about his essence and his nature to everyone who sees you. And, and he wants you to be for his glory, as created in his image for his glory, as others see the way you live and the way you manage life here in this world as his representatives. In, in ancient times, when a king would conquer a distant land, he would, he would have a statue erected, some kind of image or an icon, so that everybody in the land would know who the king is. And that's what God has done in shaping us and creating us as human beings in his image. We are that image. We are that icon that, that points to an amazing creator. So look again at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created them three times in one sentence. It says he created, he created, he created. So that says to us that there's some purpose and meaning behind our existence. We're created. We're not just an accident. Every time I make that statement, I'm reminded of something that happened in my very first church when I was a seminary student. I used to have a thing called Pastor and Friends where I'd sit on the steps and the little kids would come up and I'd give them a little Bible thought of some kind in the middle of the worship service. And on that particular day, I, I wanted to remind the kids that what the Bible says about children, that they're a gift from the Lord. I said, boys and girls, you realize you are a gift and one little girl in this bullhorn voice that you be heard all through the church said, uh-uh, my mom said I was an accident. <laughs> and, of course, mom is looking for a place to crawl under the pew. <laughs> but, but the fact is that you are not an accident. No human being is that we are created with purpose in mind. So, so being made in the image of God shapes the way we see ourselves and it shapes the way we see others. It gives us dignity. We are made in the image of God. Imagine that. Just look around you. Believe it or not, that person sitting next to you is created in the image 
of Almighty God. What an amazing thought. But lest we get too big-headed about it, remember we are just in the image of God. We are not God. We, we are creatures who are reflecting the truth about our creator. We aren't all-knowing. We aren't all-seeing. We aren't all-powerful. Like God is, we are a reflection of who he is. So in this vast universe, on this little tiny planet, God sovereignly creates the first man and the first woman, the most precious and valuable part of his creation. And God tells them to be fruitful and multiply and, 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 and in other words, have children. Now, we're told in verse 27 that the way he designed this, the way he created humans, male and female, would actually allow them to be able to do what God called them to do, and that is to be fruitful and multiply, to have children. So that is the beauty of God's design in marriage between a man and a woman, not between two men or not between two women. That, that, that makes impossible the fulfilling of God's mandate to be fruitful and multiply. And so you see the wisdom of God in his creation. So in the course of time, then Adam and Eve have kids, and they have kids, and on and on all the way to us. And, and as you track this, Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 9, you see that the offspring of the original humans, Adam and Eve, are also considered to be in the image of God. So I just want to, I, I, I can't underscore this enough. You were born with the imprint of God upon you. You are created in his image. And that, that makes us something really special. Now, let's take a little uh, field trip over to the Fort Worth Zoo, one of the best zoos in the country not too far from us here. So you're walking along through the zoo and you see all these kinds of amazing animals, creatures, snakes and birds and everything you can imagine. But try as hard as you may, you will never find an exhibit for humans. And that is because we are created uniquely. By God's design, we are set above and we are set apart from the rest of creation, just as the Bible says. And so what this does is that this gives us special dignity that animals do not possess. Now, yes, we love animals. I don't want anybody write me a nasty email about, you don't care about dogs or whatever. Have your comfort animal, your comfort skunk, or whatever you want. But listen, we are different. We are different. And, and, and so we are set above and we're set apart from from the rest of, of creation. So every human being has dignity. That child with Down syndrome, that senior adult with Alzheimer's disease, that little unborn child in a mom's womb, that one whose face is a different color from yours, who is from a different country, Yes, each individually bestowed with dignity because they are created in God's image. Now, I want to show you what that means. So along with, with, with the dignity, he, being created in the image of God gives us personality. Gives us personality. So God is a person. He is not an it. He's a he. And, and so in verse 26... There is this conversation within the Godhead. And, and now don't just skim over this because this is significant. So there's this conversation. These are persons, three persons having a conversation. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Notice the, per, the, the pronouns here. Plural. Let us make man in our image. And there are a lot of different ways to explain that. I simply think that it's pointing to the Trinity the signals to us something about God's ability and his desire to relate as a person to other persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then, in turn, this is something that is imprinted upon us. We are persons. 
And this signals something important about our purpose in life. We are created for a relationship with God. Unlike the animals at the zoo, we are created for a relationship with God and we're created for a relationship with one another. The Bible says that the supreme command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. We cannot do that without being persons. So we're created like God in that respect. It's one of the things that makes us unique. Nothing else in creation has the ability to commune, to have a relationship with, with God. And, and it's part of our being made in his image. But it also gives us, not, al- not only personality, but it also gives us rationality. Sorry for the big word, rationality. It simply means God can think. Now, that's a no-brainer, obviously. But God reasons. He plans. Verse 26 again. Let us make man in our image. So he's making a plan here. He's reasoning and, and, and he's being rational and wise. And, and we, being made in the image of God, have that same capacity. Now, obviously, we're not near as smart as God. But being made in his image gives us a particular ability to think like no other creatures can do. It's part of our being in his image. The the human brain is an amazing thing. I was reading a few weeks ago um, about a 29-year-old computer whiz named Katie Bowman. And for a number of years, she had been working on this project to try to, to develop a photograph of a black hole way out in space. And I don't pretend to, to be able to understand what a black hole is. I just know enough to know this happened. And so for years, astronomers have been collecting this data from telescopes all over the world, been bringing this data to the earth. about. But, but it's just this mountain of data that nobody could understand. But, but uh, Katie Bowman developed this algorithm that sorted through that mountain of data and started to, to pull out the, the junk and the pictures started becoming clear. You saw it happening on, on, uh, online, how that photograph became more and more and more and more focused because of this algorithm that Katie Bowman came up with. For the first time, they're looking there at a black hole. And uh, it was an amazing thing, and it just points to the capacity of the human mind to to be able to think thoughts with God. Now, I never considered science class a worship service, but it is. God has given you a brain to be able to think along with him, to observe his creation, science, astronomy, geology, Physics, all of it, it's, it's an opportunity for our minds to ponder the greatness of God and to give him glory. Sadly, though, people have hijacked science to where it gives man the glory, but it's all intended to, to, to cause us to give glory to God. And, and so th- there's this capacity that a tortoise out here at the Fort Worth Zoo cannot, cannot fulfill. Uh, And then the third thing that being created in the image of God gives us is creativity. Creativity. So Genesis 1 tells us how God goes on this creation spree. I mean, he's just creating things by his word right and left. All the way down to verse 7 where where he displays his most amazing creation of the first humans. And the evidence of God's creativity is everywhere. You stop to think about it. It's everywhere. And we've just become so accustomed to seeing it. Just think about the intricacies of your body. Amazing intricacy. The creativity of God all the way to the beauty of nature. And this creativity of God is impressed upon us as his creatures made in his image. We too have that kind of creativity. And in a way that none of the other animals possess. 
So you're not walking through the zoo and you see a giraffe with a picture hanging on the wall. Hey, everyone, look what I painted. Look at the art, the beauty that I created. Yes, they can do it in a limited way, but not like human beings. A few weeks ago, we went downtown to the Main Street Arts Festival and just booth after booth for blocks and blocks and blocks of the display of the creativity of, hum of human beings. Now, granted, I didn't appreciate all of it, but the capacity to create beauty and art is a part of our being created in the image of God. But there's more to it. We're getting deeper into what it means to be made in the image of God. And, and here is something you, truly unique for us, and that is spirituality. Being made in his image gives us spirituality. John 4, 24 says that God is spirit and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the only way we can do that is if we've been made in his image. And to be created in his image means that we are spiritual beings with the capacity and with the purpose to worship. And once again, this is where we soar above all the rest of creation. So again, we're out here at the Fort Worth Zoo and you walk by the giraffes. Now, the giraffe is not sitting there looking at you over the fence and saying, my, what an amazing creature you are. I praise God that he made you human being. No, the giraffe doesn't have the capacity to do that because he doesn't have the capacity to connect with God. And that's part of what it means to be made in his image, to, to, that we have the capacity to be conscious of God. That's no accident. Remember a little bit later in Genesis when Adam and Eve sin, it says that they, they hide from God. Why? Because they're ashamed and they feel guilty. So this spiritual connection with God has been broken because of their sin. And again, the elephant out here at the Fort Worth Zoo doesn't deal with this because he is not conscious of his maker like we as human beings are. So as God's image bearers, our life is to be directed toward God. That's inescapable for you, friend. No matter where you are spiritually, you are created with a life that is to be directed toward God. And that's the way we're designed. And that's why life is miserable for us when it isn't directed toward God. We are created as worshipers. We are spiritual beings that are designed to worship. And if we don't worship our creator, we're going to find something else or someone else to worship. It's called an idol. But being made in the image of God means that even when we are not connected with God, we have a longing for him. We have a longing for him. So we're getting really deep into what it means to be created in the image of God. Number five, it gives us authority. It gives us authority. So our place in the natural order is different from all the other animals, and you see that. It's very clear. Look again at verse 26. The Lord says, let us make man in our image and our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and the livestock, and over the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 28, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Why? You have authority. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So God has uniquely given us as human beings the assignment to be his representatives in nature and stewards of what he has created. So we bring order to the chaos. We're stewards of nature because we have the authority to do that by God as his representative. So we care for creation. We care for creation. Now the problem is that in this fallen world, we have a hard time finding the balance there. And so you see lots of crazy stuff going on in the name. Earth Day was like last Monday. And you see weird stuff happening all over the planet in honor of Earth Day. And you know what? There's truth in that because we 
we have been given authority to rule, to, to steward creation, and we should take care of creation. I'm reminded of this every time I have to ask Nana, does this go in the recycle bin or does this go in the trash can? But, but again, sometimes we take it too far. I was out in Colorado this weekend and went to a restaurant, and you cannot get a plastic straw there. You have to drink out of paper straws. Now, that's wrong. That's just totally wrong. It's, we've gone too far there. But maybe somebody knows the wisdom of that, but I don't seem to get it. But, but we're in a broken world. We're gonna, we, find this, we have a hard time finding this balance, but we cannot let it escape us that we are, we are given in God's image the responsibility to take care of creation that God has put here to sustain us. And, and, and there's a lot that goes with that. Number six, being made in the image of God gives us morality, gives us morality. So God is holy and true in every way. He alone is the judge of what is right and wrong, what is good and evil. And he established that, remember, when, when he put Adam and Eve in the garden, he had all these trees and he said, all right, I'm, I'm giving you some boundaries here. You, you may eat of these trees, this one tree, no. And so he's establishing himself as the authority of what is right and wrong, what is good and evil. And, uh, and, and so being created in the image of God, we also have that capacity to know right from wrong. We have a conscience. Even if we're not a believer, even if we're not saved, human beings made in the image of God as we are, have that ability to know that there's right and there's wrong and we know how to make decisions based upon that and to be held accountable for our choices. And when we order our lives according and around God's purposes and God's design, we thrive. But when we try to cut ourselves free from God's moral law, then we're, we're setting ourselves up for unimaginable misery. Did you hear the story about the little girl that was flying a kite? And the little kite said to the little girl, cut me loose. I want to I be free. I want to soar up and high into the heavens as I possibly can, can soar. And the little girl said, no, I can't do that. The kite says, yes, you can. I want you to cut that string. I want you to, I'm tired of being tied to you. I want to soar as high as I can possibly soar up into the heavens. Well, of course, the little girl cut the string, didn't she? And the kite immediately understood that that string was not something that was holding it down. It's actually what kept it up, what held it up. And the same thing is true. God's laws, his moral laws are not... Not what hold us down, it's what keeps us up. It allows us to thrive in this, in this world that he has created. But then there's something else that, that, that comes to us because we are created in the image of God, and that is destiny. Destiny. 1 Timothy 6.16 says that God alone is immortal. So that means that God lives Forever, And so in the absolute sense of that, God is immortal in his total being. Now, our human bodies are not immortal, but our spirits are. Our, our souls endure forever. Your body may die, but your soul continues to exist, and there is a destiny for every soul. It was created to be linked to God for eternity. But because of our sin and the terrible thing that happened in the Garden of Eden when the first humans, Adam and Eve, abused their freedom, they chose to obey God, they sinned, and from that moment on, the image of God in humanity was fractured like, and broken like a mirror. You know, you can look at a broken mirror and you can still make out your image, but it's not very clear. And so because of sin that has crept into the human experience for every single one of us, the, the image of God is still there. It's just extremely distorted. Our souls languish under this. Sin shatters our 